Costa Ricans prepare to elect a new president for the next four years in this Sunday's presidential runoff. In Russia, a Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that the recent Ukrainian helicopter attack on facilities on Russian territory could complicate bilateral negotiations. Chinese top authorities held online high-level meetings with the presidents of the European Council and the European Commission. Hi, this is From the South. I'm your news anchor, Diego Martin. From the Telstra Studios in Havana, we begin with the news. In the midst of electoral uncertainty, the people of Costa Rica are preparing to elect a new president for the next four years in the presidential runoff election this coming Sunday. Costa Rican citizens still have a little over a day to reflect on which candidate will be the best option to vote for next Sunday. They will be choosing between Social Democratic Progress Party candidate Rodrigo Chavez and National Liberation Party candidate Jose Maria Figueres. According to specialists, neither candidate has a clear majority, with polls predicting a technical tie. They say undecided voters will be the, one tip the ones tipping the scales. And the National Assembly of Nicaragua approved a reform to the general education law and a reform and an addenda to the law on the autonomy of higher education institutions, which they guarantee a, uh, that will be quality public university education. Preceded by a long debate, the approval of the law comes from the need to tune it up to modern times, taking into account that education is a global public good. The legislators of all political parties discussed the aspect related to quality, inclusiveness, and integral processes of university management and training for research and innovation. Lawmaker Walmar Gutierrez, a member of the Education Commission, said that under the new reform, the National Council of Universities will be the only governing body for higher education of Nicaragua. We are strengthening and giving the leading role to an institution that is part of the same university. That is the National Council of Universities, and we're giving it the nature of a governing body. At that same parliament session in Nicaragua, lawmaker Carlos Emilio Lopez said it was agreed that the higher education law reform will serve to ensure that all citizens have the right to free, quality university education in agreement with the national plan to fight poverty and further human development. It comes to strengthen all the processes promoted by the government of reconciliation and national unity related to restoring the right to education and Nicaraguan youth, a free quality education, inclusive, equitable, comprehensive, multicultural, contextual, relevant to the demands of today's society. Improve the dialogue process between the government and freight carrier unions began. The truckers have been on strike for four days. Peru's Council of Ministers, headed by the Ministry of Transport and Communications, announced the creation of a dialogue commission to attend to the needs of the sector after saying that it respects their rights, but that no one can block the roads. The strike has blocked dozens of major roads in several regions of the country. Truck drivers are demanding that the government eliminate fuel taxes, review highway and toll concessions, revalidate driver's licenses, and are also demonstrating against the increase in the price of fuel and demanding an economy package to help the transport sector. In this context, Peruvian President Pedro Castillo stated his government will seek to put an end to road blockades, many of which are used by the opposition to destabilize the country. Some strikes and road closures are being announced, malicious and paid for, by some leaders and some ring leaders who will put order in the next hours. Also, the Peruvian head of state reaffirmed his government is willing to dialogue, to seek dialogue, and if necessary, they will talk to the drivers on the road. The government of dialogue and understanding, and we have to do it at the table. And if you want to do it on the road, we will do it there. But you cannot stop the dream of a government and the people. The delegations of Chile and Bolivia are already in The Hague and will present their arguments before the judges today over the use of the waters of the Celal River. The process will be extended for 14 days. Chile will be the first to present the case, while the Bolivian representation will have the opportunity to respond on Monday 4th. Chile filed a lawsuit against Bolivia over the status, course, and use of this natural resource. They consider that the Silala is an international river that should be shared, while Bolivia maintains that the waters originally come from springs born in its territory that were artificially derived.
towards the border in the first half of the last century. In its pleadings today, Chile will insist on the rights it claims to have over the tributary, according to what Chilean co-agent Carolina Valdivia told Chilean media. We have been working for more than six years on this judicial proceeding before the court, and our expectations are that the claims that Chile has made and all the other procedural pleadings will be recognized. Basically, this implies that the Silala is an international river, thus the water course is subject to the applicable rules of international law pertaining to reasonable and equitable exploitation, and that the use that Chile has made of these waters is in accordance with international law. In the wake of Bolivia's appearance before the court responding to Chile's summons in the dispute over the waters of the Silala, the country's vice minister of communication, Gabriela Larcón, referred to Bolivia's intervention, offering some details. Tomorrow the case starts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon approximately, which means 10 o'clock for Bolivia. Chile is the country to start and then we will present our arguments the following week, between Monday and Tuesday, for our country. And we are asking them to take into account the fact that those presenting our arguments are international experts, so we are going to present the defense accordingly. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In Russia, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peshkov said that the recent Ukrainian helicopter attack on facilities on Russian territory To keep our attention in the outgoing situation in Ukraine and specifically in the Donbass region, we go with our special envoy Alejandro Kirk to know the latest updates from the cities of Donetsk and Luhansk. Yes, uh, we are finally back into the Donbass, uh, uh, closer to the conflict zone. And um, we were walking around Donetsk this morning. We found a city that is peaceful, that it is a little empty in, in our view. Uh, many shops are closed. Many people have left the city um, to avoid the shelling that is uh, falling over the city uh, over uh, the last period of time, the last few days. Um, we were told that 14 shells were uh, fell into civilian places in the, um, uh, here in Donetsk. Uh, walking around this street, Artyom Street, Ar Artyom Avenue actually, uh, we uh, ran into a famous war blogger that uh, was doing his report. People were greeting him 
and he agreed to speak with us for a short while. The people of Donbass have already won. If you look at everything that's going on in the world right now, and everybody, and even Russia, which is not here in Donbass, the whole Western world there, I don't know. And the South and Asia are all in shock because of what's going on. The world is changing. It's crumbling before our eyes. And only the people of Donetsk, who have lived for 80 years under the sound of this cannon fire, are walking around thinking that life is finally getting better. It is an amazing and absolutely incomparable situation. The tactic that Ukraine has chosen for itself since the beginning is not a war against the military, not against the DNR army, but a war against the civilian population, a terror of the civilian population. This is their strategy, which they have used from the beginning and which they maintain to this day, creating problems for the ordinary people whom they are supposed to consider their citizens, but they don't consider them as people. They don't have the same rights and so on. They deprive them of water, light, access to food, other things create a humanitarian disaster. Yes, and well, uh, things look calm, but when we hear the noise of cannon fire um, at a distance, 30, uh, maybe 30 kilometers away from here, we don't know whether this is uh, incoming fire or outgoing fire from the forces of the local militia, uh, which is uh, fighting to recover the entire territory of uh, the Donbass. Here in Donetsk and also in Lugansk, um, the cell, the People's Republics that were, that proclaimed independence in 2014. President Vladimir Zelensky revealed that he has loyalty problems among his troops. On Thursday night, the head of Ukrainian head of state reported that he had dismissed two generals, but hinted that they were not the only ones. In fact, Zelensky said he did not have time to deal with all of the traitors. The president has said he had dismissed General Nomov Andriolehovich, who served as head of Ukraine's main internal security department, and General Kivoryuchko Sergei Alexandrovich head of the Ukrainian security service in the Kurdistan region. The senior officers were removed from their posts for disloyalty. Zelensky said during his message that would call because he was too busy, he did not have time to deal with all the traitors, but promised to do so gradually and assured that they would all be punished. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed Thursday that Russian forces transferred control of the former Chernobyl nuclear power plant in northern Ukraine to the Ukrainian authorities. Kiev certified the transference uh, before the organism of the United Nations, which afterwards described in an official document um, of the two con Russian convoys that moved to Belarus and a third one that did to Salvutich city. Also in that nation, Rafael Grossi traveled on Thursday himself to Russia for he assured that he was trying to seek uh, the largest amount of information possible to provide uh, an independent assessment of the situation, which is why during his visit he will verify the informs and the reports that point out that some Russian soldiers have received high doses uh, of radiation while they were in the exclusion zone in Chernobyl. China on Friday accused the United States of instigating the war in Ukraine and said the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should have been disbanded following the breakup of the Soviet Union. As the product of the Cold War, NATO should have been disbanded after the collapse of the Soviet Union. As a culprit and leading instigator of the Ukraine crisis, the U.S. has led NATO to engage in five rounds of eastward expansion in the last two decades after 1999. The number of NATO members increased from 16 to 30, and they have moved eastward more than 1,000 kilometers to somewhere near the Russian border, pushing Russia to the world step by step. Neither the world nor Europe needs a new Cold War. The crisis in Ukraine has lasted for more than a month, and the vast majority of countries in the international community hope to promote peace talks and achieve a ceasefire as soon as possible. NATO should reflect on its role in European security issues and the Ukraine crisis. During a campaign rally in Belgrade on Thursday, Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic reaffirmed that his country will not join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization despite international pressure to isolate Russia. 
peace. We will preserve peace. We will preserve also the national pride and dignity. We must cooperate with KFOR, NATO-led mission in Kosovo, because our people in Kosovo have a good relationship. But when someone says, never say never, maybe we will join NATO. My answer is, we will not join NATO. We will not join NATO. We will protect our country ourselves. We will protect ourselves, our sky and our freedom. Today is day of maximum tension for Europe, for it is the deadline for the countries who impose sanctions on Moscow to pay for Russian gas and rubles. The Russian consortium Gazprom says it continues to supply natural gas according to standing orders of its customers in Europe. The company detailed in a statement on Friday that honoring its contracts in the old continent, experts grew in March by up to 15.3 billion cubic meters, a volume that exceeds all those recorded in the last seven months. The state energy company reported that the countries with the highest demand are Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Croatia, Turkey, and Poland, whose governments have been strong advocators of sanctions against Moscow. Chinese Prime Minister Li Keqiang and China's President Xi Jinping held separate online meetings on Friday with European Council President Charles Michel and with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. The Chinese Premier said a stable relationship between China and the European Union is crucial to the world's peace, stability and development. Li added that China is willing to enhance mutual trust and strengthen communication with the European Union. The Chinese Premier called on the two sides to build on the existing mechanisms to enhance policy coordination on key areas and foster new cooperation highlights. For their part, Michel and von der Leyen said that both China and the EU are important members of the multilateral system and China is an important stakeholder. The EU side laid out its views and position on the current situation in Ukraine. Li expounded China's principles and positions on the issue. He stressed that China always pursues an independent foreign policy of peace advocates compliance with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and upholds international law. The Chinese president called on the European Union to form its own perception of China and adopt an independent China policy. Since last year, China-EU relations have made new progress despite challenges, and China-EU cooperation has achieved new results in spite of difficulties. It has been proven that China and EU share extensive common interests and a solid foundation for cooperation, and that only through cooperation and coordination can the two sides resolve problems and rise to challenges. China has maintained the consistency and continuity of its EU policy and we hope that the European Union can form its own position of China, adopt an independent China policy, and work with China for the steady and sustained development of China-EU relations. Palestine has once again condemned the new Israeli escalation in the occupied territories. The Palestinian Authority has warned that the provocative crimes of Israel on the eve of the beginning of Ramadan, a holy month for Muslims, could lead to an uncontainable escalation of violence. Now, Tel Aviv's constant provocations, such as the recent visit of the right-wing legislator Itmar ben Gvir to the esplanade of the mosques in Occupy East Jerusalem, only added fuel to a very volatile situation. The occupiers' tactics, which take the form of raids, extrajudicial killings, and attacks on settlers, could plunge the region into an abyss of tensions. In this context, Hezbollah's Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah and Islamic Jihad Secretary General Ziad Najale met to discuss the latest developments in Palestine. In Syria, the President of the People's Council of Parliament, Hamouda Sabak, had a meeting in Damascus, the capital, with Iran's Islamic Consultative Assembly Vice President Ali Nekzad. At the meeting, they defined the strong and deep-rooted relation between the two countries and renewed their alliance against Tel Aviv and Washington. The Syrian Parliament Speaker emphasized that Damascus and Tehran, along with the rest of the countries of the Axis of Resistance, as they called it, stand in strong unity against the Israeli occupation regime and its Western sponsors who insist on their intention to put pressure on the peoples of the West Asian region to undermine integration, determination, and independence. On his behalf, the Persian representative, who headed a large delegation, said that the United States and its allies have failed in Syrian territory, where people and the government remain united at the forefront of resistance against violence and terrorism. We've come to the end of this news brief where you can find
these and many other stories on our website at Tell Us Our English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Our English, I am Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.